So here's a question for you. Is what blew up the Chernobyl reactor actually a zirconium explosion? Well, how can that possibly be? Well, if you take a look at the Chernobyl schematic, uh, what you'll find is there's a core, which is basically just a glorified water heater. You know, it generates its heat by nuclear power, but it's still just a glorified water heater. And you pump water around it, and it gets hot, and it generates steam that runs turbines. However, when they screwed up at Chernobyl, they had a prompt criticality, and this thing jumps from generating whatever its normal power rating is to about 10 times that amount at which point basically all the water in these pipes turns to steam in very short order although that's you know, the, the, the thing that's really critical here is it it's uh, the temperature makes the pressure very high and that just overpressures this system and there's a very large bang and it makes a mess of Chernobyl however it was the second explosion that sort of blows the top off the the reactor here so what caused that now if you go online you'll find lots of speculation about it was a hydrogen explosion you know the temperature in the core here got so hot that the water was split up into hydrogen and oxygen which is an explosive mixture which just doesn't fit as an explanation for anything. First of all, that would mean that, okay, let's just say you split up all the water into hydrogen and oxygen. It's now got to get out of the reactor before it can actually blow up. Because you just put a load of energy in to actually split it up. All you can do is release it again by burning it. Um, and also, it turns out that the auto-ignition temperature of hydrogen air mixtures is about 500 degrees celsius that's not actually that hot um you know for certain if you need temperatures of thousands of degrees in the core to split it up all you're going to do is burn it it's going to burn as it as a flame as it comes out of the core it's not going to explode so how can you get an explosion out of these things well the it, turns out one of the things if you take a look at the fuel uh fuel rod assemblies they they look like this a big block of metal and this is uh zirconium and the fuel rods uh the fuel pellets go in there and zirconium's got some great properties for neutrons in that it's almost completely transparent to neutrons it looks like glass to neutrons which is a useful property to have in a nuclear reactor however it has some bad properties as well if it gets really hot it will start to react with the water or steam to give off hydrogen which can later explode however with chernobyl the second explosion happened promptly after the critical promptly after the first one so where is my speculation at about 2000 degrees um the zirconium melts and when the zirconium melts uh either there's enough water being pumped around here still you know even after you've blown off blown some holes in your water system such that it's not uh it can't hold pressure anymore you can still pump water around here so if you're still pumping water in or your multi your zirconium in the core here starts to melt and run down into water in the, the sump, I reckon you can get an explosion very comparable to what you get with sodium reacting with water. So this is sodium potassium alloy reacting with water and the timer here is measured in ten thousandths of a second. Some what you find is in one ten thousandth of a second um it basically the whole thing explodes the purple here uh, never really quite sure what it was it's quite difficult to work out what things what's happening at one ten thousandth of a second but it's the right color for sodium and potassium gas uh it's also the right color for solvated electrons in water either way the explosion happens extremely quickly um and that's what makes sodium explode in water because it's one of those weird things you don't necessarily expect these things to explode in water because it's a heterogeneous reaction you've got all your metal here all of your water here 
and they can only react on the interface. So the only way you can get an explosion out of this, right? Because normally if you if you react all the stuff on the interface, that gets in the way of all the water getting to the metal, or the metal getting to the water. And if you're generating hydrogen as well, the whole reaction should be self-limiting. But it's not. It's also catalytic. It runs away and it's all over in uh, milliseconds. And if you take a look at it from the bottom, what you find is, oh, you can get another one. Let's try this boy. Beautiful. What you find is looking at it millisecond by millisecond. Actually, I didn't show it very well. Let's look at the stills. Um, alternatively, let's just do properties, disable resample. Let's see if that does it for us. No, it screwed up the encoding. YouTube screwed up the encoding of my video. Okay, so here it is, frame by frame. Um, and one ten thousandth of a second, you get all these spikes coming out of the metal. This is films from underneath. Um, and so what we reckon is happening there is when this really reactive metal surface comes into contact with the water, the electrons are much actually happier in the water. You need a clean surface for this to happen. So the electrons immediately hop over to the water. So you've now actually got a negative layer uh, just off the surface of the metal. And of course, the metal surface has lost a load of electrons, so that's kind of positive. And this gives you a sort of zeta potential on the surface. And once that gets equal to the surface tension, the surface no, no longer wants to try and sort of stick together like mercury. It wants to expand as much as possible, which is why the whole thing turns into a hedgehog very quickly. Now, that's an interesting speculation. But that's all it is. So I'm actually now looking at so testing this as a hypothesis which is actually quite tricky um quite tricky it's insanely difficult and the reason it's insanely difficult is let's get my the reason it's insanely difficult is because uh, conium melts at the best part at 2000 degrees celsius that's more than white hot so if you just heat zirconium up to that sort of temperature in air, it'll just oxidize on the surface. And that, mean, that means that you can't really easily do the experiment. So if we want to do the experiment like we did with the sodium potassium alloy, you're going to have to have the whole apparatus filled up with argon or helium or something like that. Then you've got to heat your metal to 2,000 degrees, more than white hot. Then you've got to drop it into the, in, into the water and film it at a very specific point. This is quite technically challenging. Um, so the key, the, the first problem is, how on earth are you going to heat your metal up to 2,000 degrees? And there aren't that many ways that you can do it. Because um, you could do it fairly quickly as well. Uh, the first one is, uh, we usually use an induction heater. So, um, let's see if we can, let's do some drawing. So an induction heater... Um, that's fine. Induction heater is basically a coil of usually fairly heavy duty copper, sometimes tubing, so you can pump coolant through it. And you oscillate the current on it backwards and forwards really quickly, which means that any metal object actually sat in the middle here just get hotter and hotter and hotter from the eddy currents until it gets red hot in a very short period of time. So that's great. It's contactless, which is fantastic. I could actually have a nice glass tube here, and then I could have the metal all on the inside. So that, yeah, it, it's contactless. Contactless is fantastic. Uh, the downside is the induction heaters are actually quite expensive. They can go up to $1,000 easily, especially if you, you're going to want something here that can pack a punch. It's going to get up to 2,000 degrees. It's actually quite challenging, even uh, even if you're only looking at melting something about the, about, about the size of a small drop, uh, about the size of your little, little fingernail. That's about the size of the drop that I'm trying to make here. Now, the other problem that you're going to have is the smaller this piece of metal in here, 
okay, there's less of it to heat up, which is fantastic. But the eddy currents uh, tend to be, um, if you've got a big piece of metal, heats up fantastically. Smaller pieces of metal, eh, not so good. So I've got all, not that much experience with induction heaters, but I suspect that's going to be not so good. Don't know for certain if anyone's got some experience with that sort of thing. I'm all ears. So another way of doing it is you get your metal, and metals are actually pretty good at absorbing, uh, well, in infrared at certain wavelengths. So you get a carbon dioxide laser, and you zap it with a carbon dioxide laser, and you can get impressive heating rates. Um, although carbon dioxide lasers are, again, fairly expensive. Um, so there are actually people who do measurements on aerodynamically yeah you see you get a little jet of argon or something and okay maybe it comes in from the top uh, you zap it with a laser and you can do me contactless measurements up at about 2000 degrees on a little molten drop either acoustically or aerodyn yeah just levitated with a little jet of, of gas possible carbon dioxide lasers are expensive as hell they're dangerous as hell and you, we would actually, it, it, how the hell are we going to then take that and drop it into the water? So this is the next problem that you've got, is the design for the original experiment was something like this. You had a big column, and at the bottom there was a glass flask. In the glass flask there was an inlet for some argon. In the bottom there was uh, some water. Oh, my artistic skills. Um, and we would just have at the top a a syringe that would would was full of sodium potassium alloy, and you squeeze a drop out of that. This is all flushed through with argon. The drop falls about one meter, hits the surface at exactly the right point. You got your high speed camera looking either here or here. Um, uh, that's basically how you do it. Tricky to do this at 2,000 degrees. I mean, 2,000 degrees is insanely hot. Um, you know, glass melts at just over a thousand. Um, gold melts at just over a thousand. Platinum is about the right range. It melts at about 2,000. Why? Well, long story, but the short one is because science. So the only other thing that I, or this is my current plan, um, and it's just to use a regular MIG welder. Now those things can, they crank out, uh, it's, about, it's about 20 volts, and they go up to about 200 amps or something. Um, and so here is the plan. I've got no idea if this will has even the slightest bat hell in chance of working, but uh, you've got two choices. You either yeah connect up your two terminals, you get a little piece of <coughs> titanium zirconium wire in the middle. Uh, I mean, you're gonna run into all sorts of problems here. Uh, when you melt metal, it tends to stick to stuff. If it sticks to stuff, game over. You need it to melt and, and to fall. That's a bit falling, oh. That's a bit falling under gravity. It's got to fall under gravity. So I'm not quite entirely sure how that's going to work. I might actually just move the whole thing down underwater. 
um, you know, for a first go at this sort of stuff. Because <coughs> now you don't have to worry about melting the drop and having it falling. Um, so you have your two terminals coming here. You've got a little piece of titanium, of, or just zirconium, sorry, in the middle there. Um, and you fry it. And at some point, uh, yeah, my, this is my worry here, is you're just not going to be able to get the heating rates on this. You know, water is actually a pretty decent heat, um, a, a mechanism of transporting heat away. Um, but it's actually quite a problem that even if you can melt this at 2,000 degrees, is it actually even going to be liquid by the time it hits the bottom here? I mean, you can hope, but um, I don't know what the heat transport uh, from the the molten zirconium to the air it was it's not going to be air it'd be something like argon in there um, or other possibility yeah I, I don't think doing it under vacuum is possible I mean even if you could right once this is all heated up to 2000 degrees it doesn't really matter whether this tube is um, under vacuum or pumped out with argon you're still going to have the saturated vapor pressure of water in here which will start reacting with our zirconium as soon as it gets to it. And this is a problem with the, the potassium, sodium potassium alloys. The second you squeeze the drop out in here, the moisture from the environment here immediately starts to form a skin on the metal. Um, so yeah, the, the, this, uh, this is kind of the plan. I have one of those. Um, I've got no idea whether it'll work. I was thinking of getting one of those. Um, uh, I, I know people who have those, but I, I, I just can't see a mechanism of, of getting that into there. Anyway, so yeah, that's the grand plan to see if I can put uh, some flesh onto this grand plan that what actually did the guts of the damage um, in the Chernobyl disaster was zirconium reacting with water in an explosion on its own that then generates this huge amount of hydrogen very quickly that can also then explode once it gets out of the reactor. So, interesting thoughts. Tell me what you think. <laughs>